Hey everyone, my name is Greg and today we're going to learn about the Google Colab environment. So this is not a specifically Python tutorial in Google Colab, although we will write a little bit of Python code, very little. This is showing how the environment works and just what it's about. So basically, if you're not familiar with Jupyter or Jupyter Notebooks, basically what they are is this way to write Python code and what we call I, so interactive, Python, so Pi, and then NB notebooks. So we're writing code in interactive Python notebooks, where what that means is basically ignoring text for now, because that's really just text. We'll look into that a little bit. You write code and usually Python code into these cells, where for example, I could get a variable, maybe X is equal to five. So I made an integer five and made that equal to X. And we can actually output that without even writing print. We can go ahead and just leave that as the last line, as long as that's the last line even over here, it's still going to output it because these are just empty lines. It outputs that variable and puts it right here and what we call, say, the output terminal. And actually, you can sort of interface with the operating system a little bit in Google Colab as well. For example, with exclamation, you can do something like ls, which is like list all of the files. That's how you do that in Linux. Well, it does that same thing. It shows sample data. That's really all that's here. We have this sample data folder, which has a bunch of pre-existing files that are often used for data science. So most of the time, IPython notebooks are for data science and machine learning. Not always, but most of the time. And so they do have these files included in there already. So it's pretty similar to Jupyter, but the main difference is that you go and connect to a runtime and you can change the runtime type as well and get a GPU or TPU, even if your own computer doesn't have one. So this is a cloud-based and internet-based thing where you have to go into the browser, go to Google Colab, and although it may look like it's running on your computer, most of this stuff is not actually running on your computer. You are just interfacing with it via this notebook, you know, writing the code here. What it actually does is puts this all on Google servers and completely for free. Unless you get Colab Plus, which I think gives you more RAM, sometimes you run out of RAM. Machine learning models do tend to eat up RAM a lot, so you may actually run out of RAM, and you can get better access to GPUs or TPUs with Colab Colab Plus, but unless you do any of that, you are just using Colab servers for free so that you can train machine learning models or just really write code in, in a nice way without worrying about a fancy computer. You don't have to go out and buy some big system so that you can train machine learning models. And you know, if you are like a company or someone that's making a startup and you're relying on training important machine learning models, Colab may not be enough for you. You may have to go for some sort of an upgrade for one of the cloud-based systems or get your own system like a good NVIDIA or AMD. And actually the Apple stuff is getting better for GPUs as well. Um, but this is a cloud-based resource mainly for education purposes. So probably you're not going to want this if you are a heavy-duty user. It's more so great for just kind of testing things and mostly learning. So we've seen a couple of the pieces. You can write code and then you can kind of interface with the operating system. We could do that a little bit more. We could do exclamation, which really just means interface with the, the OS versus the actual Python code. If you don't do exclamation, you're just writing Python. Python code. If you're doing an exclamation, you could do something again like PWD. That means print the working directory. They made our working directory slash content. And if you really wanted, you know, you could actually tool around here and view hidden files. This tab here, this is your files. And you could go into look around here, but almost all of the time, uh, you won't need to do any of this. You may want to make a new folder and you can do that if you want. You could do exclamation mcdir. We'll just call it new underscore folder. We'll do that and you should if you refresh you will actually see a new folder and you can do stuff like that if you want to something interesting in google colab and i believe is only available in jupyter notebook uh, if you have some extensions is this kind of variable thing and you're seeing stuff that actually shouldn't really exist because i did this earlier these are all of the variables that it currently has stored and so you can actually look them up so if we did something like f is equal to we'll just make it the list of one two and then three we should actually see f pop up over here and you can filter by it if i type f that is going to come up just a normal alphabetical based search and it says it's a shape of three items so the shape thing is basically actually if you hover it apparently it does show you what it is um, the shape 
only really makes sense for uh, for numpy arrays and the reason that it, that's actually getting its own column is because again this is often for training machine learning models having stuff in numpy arrays is, and tensors is extremely common and so this is a two by two array uh, you can't see it because this was earlier but if i did show you uh, i made a earlier and it's the numpy array with the uh, the first row is one two and the second row is three four and so its shape is two by two it has two rows and two columns now just a quick example of text if you wanted to you could easily write any text you just do the add text thing there or maybe add text here by the way you can just kind of delete cells as you want to here delete and you can also move them around this is moving this one into different locations i'll just place it back at the bottom you could put any text anywhere you wanted and if you just type some text say hi well, all that is is going to have high. It really follows the markdown rules in sort of slightly different and weird scenarios. Uh, but what it is basically is if you do another text and then we write, say, a hashtag, a hashtag, and then high, what that single hashtag was, and by the way, I'm double clicking to go into the editor there and I'm just single clicking to, to look at how it looks normally. If I double click there, you'll see the hashtag and then I think you do need the space in between. Uh, no, actually you don't. So just hashtag and then text. Normally people put a space there though. Uh, you should be able to see in the table of contents, we have this section called high. Uh, and if you were to do say another piece of text anywhere else, you could do two hashtags and then say high as well. And basically what that does is it is see and indents it because that's a subsection. We have the main section high, and then we have a subsection uh, of this high as well over here. And I believe the furthest level of indenting you can go is three. So we could do, a, or maybe four actually, but it, I don't think you can go infinitely. At least you definitely don't want to go past three or four. If we do another hashtag, we'll do three hashtags and then say hello. That is going to nest it under that section. And if you did say, you know, just two of them, we could do uh, high, we'll just do uh, the number seven. You can see that places it at its appropriate level indentation. That has two hashtags, and so that goes at the same level of the other two hashtag thing. So you can build up a table of contents that way if you wanted, and you could make it simple and just do only single sections. So you could say, you know, this is high two, this is another section, and it seems to be placing it under that. No, there we go. It takes a second for it to figure it out sometimes. Uh, but what the nice thing is, is you can click on these, and it's going to bring you to those uh, appropriate sections in the code. So wherever you want to kind of set up your table of contents where you have Sometimes people, when they're training models, they'll do something like, um, you know, getting the data or actually imports and then getting data, pre-processing, model training, final evaluation, uh, maybe, maybe an exploratory data analysis. You could make all of those a section and then you could have subsections within those if you wanted to. And that makes it look good both for the organization of the code, like from the table of contents level, and just looking at the code uh, it can really help people, especially if you are sharing these with people, uh, it can really help people understand and yourself what is going on. Again, if you did want to get a GPU, you can always go into runtime and then change runtime type. No, by default, you won't have a hardware accelerator, which is just a graphics processing unit. And then there's a tensor processing unit. GPU is for both gaming display uh, and for number crunching. Still on here, they really mean it just as a number cruncher or for machine learning. And for TPU, in this context, you can really think of that as just an advanced GPU. Uh, and so they're gonna have least access to TPUs a little bit less access to GPUs, and you should very rarely have trouble uh, finding a server and, and appropriate resources when you're just on none here. Uh, and why am I saying this thing about resources? Well, basically how this works uh, is that Google treats you, you know, how you treat it. And so if you go to really abuse a GPU, like if you're just, when you're logging into your account and you're constantly using a GPU, uh, they are not gonna like you for that. TPU, you know, they're not gonna like you for that either. Just use it when you have to, use it for a couple of minutes when you're training a model, and then you shouldn't run into any difficulties. But uh, yeah, just be, just be nice to them because they're being nice to us for doing this for free. Now a little bit into the Python code, just to make sure we understand Jupyter itself. Now this is a little bit different than just running a Python script top to bottom. 
because as you can see, we still have all of these variables that exist right now. If we go into variables, you'll see all of these things. Normally, like in a Python script, it'll just run top to bottom. You know, occasionally like you'll jump around for functions, or you'll jump up and down for loops or, or if statements and stuff. But uh, in general, you run it from top to bottom and then you're not gonna have like any variables like in memory or whatever. Uh, that stuff is gonna be gone because you just ran a script and it should be done. But here it's not really done because we have access to all these things. You have access to F here and you have access to X. And if you wanted to, you could run a loop for I in range four and we will just do print I. So you could do that and then you could change a variable, maybe make a new variable. We'll say LST is equal to just the list of four, five, six, and then each time we will go in and lst.append with i. So we can do that. And firstly, well, what's that gonna do? It prints the same thing, but lst down here, you can see now four, five, six, zero, one, two, three. We modified that variable. And then what you could do is just remove this line and then you could do it again. And what that does is it appends to that list. It kept the same one because you didn't redeclare it. It kept that same one and then it appended four more things. And you could do that uh, again and again if you wanted to, and that's gonna keep growing. Of course, you wouldn't really want to do something exactly like that, but the point is to display the fact that we have these variables in mem memory. You're not just running a script top to bottom, everything's deleting, you are modifying these variables. Uh, and this is very useful for data science and machine learning because often you're like manipulating a pandas array and you might wanna do some things here or there and keep it in memory and look at it later. Uh, and you might want to train a model and then, you know, do something for 10 minutes, just like, you know, figure some things out and then, you know, maybe use that model or, or tweak some things. Now you can upload and download files into this environment, uh, but just be a little bit wary that uh, it's an online resource that you're not really dedicating and you don't have full access to. So just because you upload a file here, for example, uh, there is no guarantee that if you were to look an hour later or even five or 10 minutes later, that that file is still gonna be there because uh, you, your resources could uh, get washed up at any point. However, downloading can be extremely powerful because uh, you know once you do something on here, download it, that file will be on your computer you know, until something you know wrong or you delete it on purpose happens. If you wanted to, to kind of combat that issue, you could mount your drive here, permit this notebook access to your Google Drive files. So what it's saying here, connecting to Google Drive will permit code executed in this notebook to modify files in your Google Drive until access is otherwise revoked. So you could have that access access to your Google Drive. Therefore, you're not really gonna lose files. Actually, it, it puts it in right there. Um, that way you're not really gonna lose files because you can just, you can move them to and from your Google Drive and then you don't really have to worry about that. To be honest, I scarcely use this. I mostly upload things and then, you know, they're usually on my computer saved no matter what. And if I need to re-upload it again, I will re-upload it again. Uh, and if I need to download something, I will, I will quickly download that and then not worry that it's gonna disappear because I've already saved a file of that. Um, so usually I don't actually do this and I don't remember the complexities on how that involves, but it's not super bad. There are some helpful tutorials out there uh, if you wanna learn about mounting your Google Drive. Just so you know some of the complexities of this, uh, occasionally you will run out of RAM, and if so, it's probably going to crash and you'll lose most of your results. If that happens, you'll probably just have to connect to a runtime again and you're probably good to go. Uh, sometimes things are gonna just look like they're gonna go forever and then you go to cancel them. So for example, I could do something like for i in range of a very, very big amount. And I will show you what happens. We'll try to print I, but it's not gonna be, actually, I'm not gonna print anything. I'm just gonna do pass. This will irritate it. Eventually, this will probably figure out that it's not gonna work. Uh, but for us, what we wanna do is try and stop it. That did stop it. And so you're lucky that it got keyboard interrupt and you're good to go. Um, and this does not kill, the, most of the time this does not kill your environment, by the way. We should still have our previous variables uh, in X right here. Uh, but not always, there will be times for sure when even if you click stop here, uh, you know, it's doing something complicated and it's not gonna wanna stop. So what if, if that does happen, you can try to do runtime interrupt execution, try to keep interrupting it. 
Uh, and if not, you are going to have to restart runtime, which is going to fix your problems uh, and maybe disconnect and delete runtime. But most of the time, I usually don't click this one. I usually start, I usually do restart runtime if there's any big issues. Uh, and then you'll just run the cells by hand. Or if you wanted, you could do a run all as well. But uh, be careful about the run all because the very last thing that ran into a problem would probably run into a problem again. I mean, it depends what your variables are uh, and how you have kind of the order in which you did things, but uh, be wary of the run all because you might just run into the same problem again and again. Okay, sorry, I don't have the camera turned on because I'm doing this the next day. I can't believe I forgot that if you need a new environment that does not exist already. So for example, import scikit-learn, we do that with import sklearn, that works, okay? It doesn't have any problem with that because scikit-learn is installed into the library. And actually we can see what is installed with pip and then list. That's gonna show you all the different environments. All of this stuff exists in there already. So it has TensorFlow, SQL, scikit-learn, scikit-learn pandas, scipy, a lot of different libraries, mostly for data science and machine learning related stuff. If there is one that is not installed already, and there is tons of them, you can do pip install and then whatever that library is. So one example of something that's not in there by default is auto SK learn. So I will try to do import auto SK learn like that. That is how you do it. If you looked up the documentation, they would tell you how to import it. It's like that, except that doesn't work. There's no module named that. And so we need to do the pip install. And so you would look up how to do that. You'd look up how to do pip and then look at the documentation online for that specific library, they would tell you in this specific case, pip install auto-sklearn. So I'm gonna run that, it's going to go and download that. And sometimes, depending on what happens, if it's using libraries that are already installed and messing around with the versions of those, as we'll see, we saw scipy and scikit-learn in here, probably Dask is there as well. If it does that, it may tell you at the end, what you'll see here after all of this stuff, sometimes, is it will tell you to restart the runtime. And that is only the case if it is involving libraries that have already been installed. So as you can see here, it's sort of installed SciPy, uninstalled other versions. It does some weird stuff. And so it will say you must restart the runtime in order to use the newly installed versions. And so if I were to do import auto sklearn, it still doesn't like that. It actually gives a different error message about versions. What you can do to fix that in this case is runtime. And then we will do restart runtime that clicks yes. And after that's restarted, you should be able to not do the pip install again. You should just be able to import it. And you can see this time it worked properly. So not always will you have to restart the runtime, but sometimes you will. Sometimes you can just pip install a library and then you can import it right away. Other times you have to restart the runtime, but that's how you get new Python libraries. And if you did need to get a different version specifically of a different library, say that you specifically wanted to pip install numpy equals equals 1.18, and you could try and do that. And if there is a specific version like that, it'll get the 0, .0 by default, numpy equals 1.18, or whatever version of whatever specific library you wanted. It may have trouble with that depending on the other versions of other things, and again, you may have to restart the runtime as well to use those new installed versions. But if you wanted a specific version, you would do it like that. And if you wanted a new library, you could also get the newest version of something with pip install dash dash upgrade and then numpy. What that will do is try its best to get the most up-to-date NumPy or whatever library version. And again, it may have difficulty with other things. Again, it might not like other libraries because of the way that pip uh, in Python works, but you can try and do it like that. I hope this was helpful and uh, drop a like if it was. Maybe consider subscribing to the channel if you're not subscribed already. Uh, and I'll see you next time, guys.